Good morning. Welcome to our online Sunday School lesson for Sunday, January 29th. Looks like the month of January is slipping away on us. Uh, January 29th of 2023. Welcome to our lesson. The title of today's lesson is, He Sent Me. Uh, the explanation for this week's lesson uh, from the teacher's book said, Jesus was sent by the Father so we could know the Father. Uh, if you want to look at that like I did from a different way, Jesus was sent by God so we could know God and know him better. How many of you remember what we call the blue laws? Uh, this was a commentary, uh, or as I studied in the commentary this week. Again, I want to give credit to Charles Ray Jr., uh, the retired uh, uh, professor from the New Orleans Theological Seminary. Uh, he wrote this, and it went along with the lesson so well today. Uh, Blue Laws, I remember them when I was a child. Blue Laws were written years ago in the United States to prohibit and restrict certain activities, mostly on Sundays. Uh, as I researched this week, I found out that Blue Laws, uh, or the different name when they were first started, were called Christian's Laws were enacted in colonial America in the 1700s to protect the Christian Sabbath as mandated by the Fourth Amendment to our Constitution. Uh, the Fourth Amendment give us freedom of religion. For instance, and I looked this up, in 13 of our 50 states, you still today, because of blue laws, cannot buy a car on Sunday. Uh, now, as I studied that, I, I had to look, and, and I'll say this, uh, South Carolina is not one of those that still enforces that blue law. Uh, we've broken that law uh, already and taken it off the books. You can buy a car on Sunday here in South Carolina. At one time, blue laws were a way of life. I, as I said, I can remember it when I was a child across the United States. Dating back for centuries, blue laws regulated what activities were allowed and what were not allowed on Sunday. As I mentioned, Mr. Ray offered us an introduction to this week's lesson uh, that dealt with the subject of blue laws. Uh, says in his opening comments that he took a youth group when he was pastor of a church to a youth conference and he went on Sunday. On the way there, the bus that they had broke down in this small town. Luckily, we had a separate van with us at the time, so some of the adults, as we left the kids with the bus and waiting on the serviceman to arrive, some of the adults drove the van to the local grocery store to get some food and something to drink for the youngsters uh, as they waited for the bus to be serviced. When the adults got to the little country store, Part of the store was taped off uh, to show that those aisles, those items that was taped off, you were not allowed to buy on Sunday. Even though you could peer over the tape and you could see the items, you could not ring them up or buy them uh, on Sunday. To show the blue laws and how unattached they have become from people uh, back in those days, uh, Let's apply the blue laws when this uh, pastor and his adults went to the grocery store. I'm going to give you a couple of examples of what he saw that Sunday. You could not buy an ice chest uh, for some putting on drinks and stuff, but you could buy a garbage can. So the adults with him decided they was going to buy a garbage can, fill it with some garbage bags, and put ice down in it and put the drinks on it to get the drinks chill uh, for the youngsters back on the bus. You say, why was that? Why was that law still prevalent at the time they had the bus break down? Uh, another one I want to look at, you could not buy pre-made sandwiches or pre-made meals on Sunday. But you could buy peanut butter, you could buy jelly, you could buy sliced ham. You could buy mayonnaise, you could buy mustard, and you could buy bread. 
So you like me, they eventually figured out how to get the kids some sandwiches to keep them from going hungry uh, as they waited on the bus to be serviced. We were able to get the kids from going hungry and still were able to follow the blue laws on that Sunday. In today's lesson, the Jewish leaders in Jerusalem rehashed the story about and rehashed the lame man where Jesus had healed him on the Sabbath. Then he was told by Jesus to take up his cot or his mat or his bed and walk. Jesus wanted other people to know that he had the power to heal. Now, he, these Jewish leaders rehash what Jesus had done more than six months. And I want to share that because that interests me today. And I did, as Preacher D's, I did a rabbit trail there and I looked it up. Why does the Bible mention it, or the teacher's book mention it was six months later after he was healed that they rehashed what Jesus had done on the Sabbath? For you see, Jesus had healed the crippled man on the Sabbath, then told the man to take his bed and walk. Go, spread the word. When he picked up his mat, he broke the Mosaic laws. They did not see Jesus as who he was, God's son, who had given them the laws to start with, but the fact that he broke the Jewish laws that had been written by the Jewish rabbis and the priests and the Pharisees. For us to understand today's lesson, and I did this, Looking with me at Jeremiah chapter 17, verses 21 and 22. As I read this, you might say, these sound like the blue laws. Uh, they became outdated. Uh, they became irrelevant to the world that we live in. Jeremiah chapter 17, verses 21 and 22. Thus saith the Lord, Take heed to yourselves and bear no burden on the Sabbath day, nor bring it in by the gates of Jerusalem. Neither carry forth a burden out of your houses on the Sabbath day, neither do you any work but hallow ye the Sabbath day, as I have commanded you and your fathers. This was given to the Old Testament prophet Jeremiah, over 800 years before Christ came to earth. Now he was here. This was around 30 to 31 AD that Jesus walked the earth and was sent to earth as God's son to do God's work. This was part of the Mosaic laws given by God to the Israelites, God's chosen people over 800 years ago. As I studied further into some of the Jewish laws, because I became interested in what law, other than Jeremiah chapter 17, did this man break by picking up his bed and doing as Jesus said, walk. I found that the scribes and Pharisees who interpret the Mosaic laws from the scripture really wrote down in details things you could and could not do on the Sabbath. Uh, I, as I read this list, I said, I got to share that uh, with my folks that uh, listen online. They actually wrote it, it was called the 39 laws, the 39 actions you could not do on the Sabbath or you would break the Mosaic laws. Listen to these. You couldn't plant, you couldn't plow, you couldn't reap, you couldn't gather, you couldn't thrash. You couldn't winnow, sort, grind, sift, or knead. You couldn't cook, shear, laundry, comb, dry, spin, warp, make two loops, weave, separate two loops, tie, untie. You couldn't sew, you couldn't tear. You couldn't trap, you couldn't slaughter. Skin, cure, smooth, score, or measure. You couldn't write, you couldn't erase, you couldn't build or demolish, you couldn't extinguish a fire, you couldn't start a fire, you couldn't apply a finished touch to anything, 
And get this, number 39, you cannot transfer between domains. You couldn't transfer between domains. Now, if you remember the story of the crippled man at the pool of Bethesda, let me go back to John chapter 5 in the first eight verses, and I want to refresh that story uh, in your mind so you can understand what Jesus did. After this, there was a feast of the Jews, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Now, there's at Jerusalem by the sheep market a pool, which is called in the Hebrew tongue Bethesda, having five porches. In these lay a great multitude of impotent folk, of blind, halt, withered, waiting for the moving of the water. For an angel went down in a certain season into the pool, and trouble the water. Whosoever then first after the troubling of the water stepped in was made whole of whatsoever disease he had. And a certain man was there. And we're going to take based on law number 39. This was his domain laying by the pool of Bethesda. He had an infirmity for 30 and 8 years. When Jesus saw him lying there and knew that he had been now a long time in that case, he said unto him, Wilt thou be made whole? The impotent man answered him, Sir, I have no man when the water is troubled to put me into the pool, but while I am coming, another steppeth down before me. Jesus saith unto him, Rise, take up thy bed, and walk. The story of the crippled man at the pool. Jesus saw the man. He felt compassion in his heart. He healed him. He had that power. He was from God. He was God's son. Then he told a man, you are now healed. Rise up, walk, and take your bed. Guess what? He broke law number 39 of the Sabbath laws. Let's study chapter now 7. In the first, we're going to study just about all of chapter 7. So if you don't mind, get your Bibles out. Turn to chapter 7, verses 1 through 3. We're going to discuss first. After these things, Jesus walked into Galilee, for he would not walk in Jewry, because the Jews sought to kill him. Now the Jews' feast of tabernacles was at hand. His brethren therefore said unto him, Depart hence and go to Judea, that thy disciples also may see the works that thou doest. It's now time for the Feast of the Tabernacles. There are three required feasts uh, that the old Jews or the, the Jews must celebrate according to the Old Testament. That was the Feast of the Passover, the Feast of Pentecost, and the Feast of the Tabernacles. The Feast of the Passover, as we just studied a few weeks ago, this was when Jesus was in Jerusalem the last time. It usually occurs around Easter. Uh, for us now in the spring, uh, Easter is determined after the, is, is the first full moon after the spring solstice, which is usually around March 15th to March 20th. Uh, that's the time of the year uh, when we change uh, from the winter months to the spring months, uh, around March the 20th. Uh, then you're looking for the first full moon after that uh, spring solstice. And that determines when Easter is. That's why Easter varies sometimes between March and early April. Now, the, the Jews were required to celebrate the Feast of the Passover, a day of celebration when the death angel passed over the houses with blood on their, cloth, on their uh, doors. Uh, that had happened years before, and they were required to celebrate that Passover to give God the glory for it. Jesus was here in Jerusalem for that feast uh, that you remember when he healed the man at the pool of Bethesda. Now, just to give you a, a couple of relevant thoughts here, uh, the Feast of Pentecost is the feast to mark the descent of the Holy Spirit on those that believe. Now, that happened over in the New Testament, but they were required to celebrate that, and that happens 50 days after Easter. Then there was the third feast, the required feast of tabernacles. The people would gather in booths or temporary boxes 
or huts to commemorate their wilderness wanderings, wanderings and offer a sacrifice according to your family status. This would take place in the seventh month, or now as we would call that, October. This verse, Jesus says, Jesus went up to Jerusalem being the seventh month. He healed the crippled man at the feast of the Passover. So, uh, according to the teacher's book, we're now six months later, and here's Jesus going back to, to Jerusalem to celebrate the Feast of the Tabernacles. Now turn with me to chapter 7, verses 11 and 12. Then the Jews sought him at the feast and said, Where is he? And there was much murmuring among the people concerning him, for some said, He is a good man. Others said, Nay, but he deceiveth thy people. Jesus went to the feast in Jerusalem, the Feast of the Tabernacles. Once there, many people sought him out. They began to ask among themselves, where is he? Uh, I learned this week, and you can read from these two verses, that there were two types of people uh, that sought after him. The first one was the people that heard him and the people that was healed by him. They sought him to see more miracles, to see him help other people and possibly be able to help him or them as they got close to him and see just exactly who was this man doing all these miracles and what he was doing and how he had the power to be able to save and heal these people. Then there were the Jewish leaders. We will call those scribes, Pharisees, Sadducees. These were the ones who had wrote and defined and interpreted the Mosaic laws uh, into what we would call today the blue laws, the things you could and could not do based on that scripture. Uh, they sought him and taught, sought Jesus out also, but their reasoning for seeking him out was to arrest him and make him pay for telling the crippled man to take his bed and walk. For causing this man to break the laws, they wanted to kill Jesus. They wanted him because he caused others to break the law. But as I studied it, I also learned that none of these people actually knew who Jesus was. Even though those who thought him to be good thought he was just a prophet, just an ordinary man that had been raised to preach. This was the long-awaited Messiah, and no one recognized him as the Messiah. Now our lesson today skips over to verses 14 and 15, and this is where we start. Uh, now that you know that background, let's look at verses 14 and 15 in chapter 7. Now about the midst of the feast, Jesus went up into the temple and taught. And the Jews marveled, saying, How knoweth this man letters, having never learned? In the middle of the feast of the tabernacles, Jesus goes into the temple and begins to teach. This would be the time when the largest crowd of people were in the, te were in the temple. Uh, this would be those folks that had been healed, those who were look looking to see him teach, then also those Jewish leaders or the Pharisees. They would have all been in the temple listening to him when he started teaching. Everyone who heard him speak or teach were amazed with what power and authority for which he spoke. All recognized his words that were more powerful than any priest that had ever spoke before him. The Bible says they were amazed at the power he had when he taught these things. How could he heal people and how could he teach? Where did he get this anointing from and how could he know so much? Verse 15 says, They marveled. At him. They flat could not understand how he had become so learned. His teaching was so much different than theirs. He spoke with his own authority, he says, not something he had learned from someone else. So many of the people today began to question Jesus. How does he do this? How does he know so much? How can he teach like this? 
John chapter 7, verses 16, 17, 18, Jesus answers the people. If any man will do his will, he shall know of the doctrine, whether it be of God or whether I speak of myself. He that speaketh of himself seeketh his own glory, but he that seeketh his glory that sent him, the same is true, and no unrighteousness is in him. Jesus answers the people and said, My teaching is not my own, but from him that sent me. Maybe we could understand better if Jesus had said, Not my teaching, but my father's teachings. Jesus was telling the people that God's doctrine had not changed. They could not understand the fact that with Jesus telling the man to take his cot and walk was not breaking God's word. It wasn't breaking God's law. God was the one that healed the man. Jesus was just doing the work of God. He was not breaking God's laws. He was only breaking the interpretation by man, man's interpretations of the laws. Jesus says over and over and over, and still he says to us today, he did not come to break the law or change the laws, but to fulfill the laws. John chapter 7, verse 19. Did not Moses give you the law, and yet none of you keepeth the law? Why go ye about to kill me? Did Moses give you the law? Why have none of you kept the law then, if you're writing all these laws to follow the law? The scriptures and the Pharisees, the scribes and the Pharisees, in trying to define the laws from scripture, had defined the laws in such a way that no one, including the scribes and Pharisees, could keep the laws. Jesus reminded them that Moses had given the laws from God. By giving them the first five books of the Bible, they thought by man's interpretation that they had led people to follow the law. While they boasted they followed the laws of tradition, they fail to understand the matters of godliness. Then Jesus questioned them again. If thou shalt not kill, why do you seek to kill me? That is one of the Ten Commandments, but yet you're breaking it. The Pharisees answers Jesus in verse 20. The people answered and said, Thou hast a devil who goeth about to kill thee. It had become a custom for the Pharisees and the scribes. If anyone didn't follow their interpretation of the law, they would say that those things were of the devil. Anything they did not understand, they proclaimed as the work of the devil. They knew that they had started plotting to kill Jesus, and now he knew it. But they lied and denied it in this verse. Jesus then gives them another lesson. For them to learn. Verses 21 through 24. Jesus answered and said unto them. And this is in red. I have done one work. And ye still marvel. Moses therefore gave unto you circumcision. Not because it of Moses. But of the fathers. And ye on the Sabbath day. Circumcise a man. If a man on the Sabbath day. Receive circumcision that the law of Moses should not be broken. Are you angry at me because I have made a man every whit whole on the Sabbath day? Or without breaking the law of Moses, the law of Moses judge not according to the appearance, but judge righteous judgment. Jesus is trying to teach them here that when he does good on the Sabbath, he's doing God's will, not his own will. He's doing good. He is not teaching God's law. He is not breaking God's law. Sorry for that. He is God's son and God sent him to do it. He then says, think with me. Let's think together. You, the scribes, the Pharisees, the Jewish leaders, teach it is okay to circumcise a man on the Sabbath. You break this law and think nothing about it. He is showing them with a comparison how foolish they are to think that circumcising a man on the Sabbath is right when healing a man on the Sabbath is wrong. 
Can you get that? Uh, and you're angry at me, Jesus, for doing the healing. Now again, uh, as I do from time to time, I, I said, why did he say that? Uh, well, let me show you what I learned this week. I'll share it with you. A male Hebrew child must be circumcised according to the Mosaic laws on the eighth day after being born. If the eighth day fell on a Sabbath, then they had to break the law of not working to circumcise the child. That's the law. You can't work on Sunday. But it was okay to follow another law that said you must circumcise on the eighth day. Jesus says you must break the law and call it right. Jesus is trying to make them see that the Sabbath was not a technicality that required a great, great, great group of technical laws, a list of 39 things you could not do, but it was to help the people to call for a, a day for the people to rest. That's what the law said. Thou shalt honor the Sabbath day and keep it holy. What do you do on Sunday? Uh, nowadays, the, 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 the Sabbath day. What do you do not do? I can understand back when I was a young child uh, and I was uh, what you call a drug child. I was drugged to church and drugged to church and drugged to church. But my mama would not let me swim uh, on Sunday uh, when I was young. She felt like I was breaking the law. Today, I've got repentance. Uh, I enjoy swimming. And I get a lot of relaxation from it. It causes my body to rest. So my mom's gone to heaven. I plan to go to heaven to meet her, uh, but we disagree. Uh, I don't think it's wrong to swim on Sunday. Uh, so I do occasionally, I do take some time and jump in the water on Sunday uh, as a way of relaxing and resting. But Jesus is saying here, don't judge people by some law. Judge people by what you have and what you think they have in their heart. As believers, we must examine our own lives for hypocrisy. Are we judging others based on laws? Or are we judging others based on what you see coming from their heart? Now, verses 25 through 29, and we'll finish up. Then said some of them in Jerusalem, Is not this he whom they seek to kill? But lo, he speak boldly, and they said nothing unto him. Do the ruler, rulers know indeed that this is the very Christ? Howbeit we know this man whence he come, but when Christ cometh, no man knoweth whence he is. Then cried Jesus in the temple as he taught, saying, You both know me, and you know whence I am, and I am not come of myself, but he that sent me is true, whom you know not. But I know him, for I am from him, and he has sent me. Most all people know by now that the Jewish leaders and Pharisees sought out to kill Jesus at this time. Even though they sought the leaders to seek him out and arrest him, it's because they knew truly, deep down, that Jesus was indeed the Messiah, the Christ. They realized that they and their teachings were no match for Jesus and his teachings. They just could not believe Jesus was actually the Messiah. They thought the Messiah would come and be born in Jerusalem and be a great military leader that would lead them out of their conflicts with other countries. They thought he would be a great warrior king. Jesus came with a humble heart and a humble spirit came from humble beginnings. Even though the Old Testament scripture said he would be known or be born in Bethlehem of a virgin mother, they just couldn't believe that Jesus had actually came and that he was a Messiah. Had they really studied and understood the Old Testament, they would have known for sure that indeed Jesus was a Messiah. Finally, Jesus says to them, you know me in the flesh, you know my mother, you know I live right here among you, but you still do not know who I am. 
Today, let me ask you as we finish up, do you know him for who he is? Do you know him as Savior? Jesus tells them and tells us today, God the Father sent me. Jesus took on a fleshly body as he came to earth to walk on earth to, so he could understand the things we have to do every day to walk upon this earth. But one day, God willing, I'm going to be able to walk the streets of gold. I'm going to see Jesus and I'm going to see all my loved ones. And you can too. But then the people, the Jewish leaders, killed him on an old rugged cross. But on that old rugged cross, he took my sins and your sins to that cross and he laid there and died with them. But there again is our Lord who is much different than any professed God today. He is our God because he arose on the third day. And he sits with God today up in heaven, watching us and waiting for us and building us a mansion. He is on a mission to save everyone. So that's how my mission today is to lead you to know this man I call Savior, Jesus, Lord of Lord, King of Kings. As I close today, I was reminded uh, in, the, in the book this week of, of a little closure that sort of puts uh, understanding to what the Jewish leaders thought about their laws. The story you see goes of two older ladies who live together. One summer evening, they were sitting on their porch, enjoying the peacefulness of the evening. One woman heard the sound of a church choir a few doors down as they practiced. The other woman mentioned about the beauty of the crickets chirping as being sent by God and so beautiful. The woman listening to the choir said about the choir, isn't that a lovely thing that God has created? The other woman said, isn't that a lovely thing that God has created the chirps of the crickets as we listen? In the end, both were confused. For you see, God provided the voices in the choir and God provided the sound of the crickets. The question remains, did the ladies have God in their heart to recognize him in their lives or were they listening to God? and his creations. Don't be confused like the ladies. Know God for sure. Understand his word. Thanks for listening to our lesson this week. I hope you've enjoyed it. We're praying right now as we close for those around us sick, those that had special needs this week, and those families that we've had lost loved ones. We're praying for comfort right now, Lord, that you'll touch each one of them. Lord, for those that's facing surgery or have had surgery, give them comfort, give them strength, give them your love, Lord. For those families that need an extra comfort due to the loss of loved ones, uh, as we've had in our own family, Lord, we pray for the family that's lost that loved one this week. Lord, help this to be a good worship day. Help us to have a good worship service in our church. Help the leaders of our church to be God-driven men that will open your word and study your word and share your word with the world and the people that needs to know you better. Help us to understand that, Lord, uh, Jesus is your son. He came to earth and he died on a cross for us, and we thank you for it. For it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen, and we hope to see you next week. Goodbye.